We're very pleased to have uh, Bob Hall from Stanford here. He's a member of the National Academy of Science, fellow of the American Economic, uh, a fellow of the American Arts and Science, Academy of Arts and Science, and the Economic Society. And he's really an intellectual force in the profession. Uh, he has the gift of looking at classical problems from a different angle and come up with two new, uh, very new insights. So he's very well known for his classic consumption results, the random walk benchmark, and I think he's probably also well known as, uh, for the fact that he divided the macro profession into salt water and fresh water. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, he is on top of the things and uh, looks in an eclectic way on all the issues and has the framework to do this. And we're very pleased to have him here today to talk about consumption smoothing, intertemporal substitutions versus the household financial squeeze in the Great Recession. Thanks a lot. The floor is yours. Great. <clears throat> so if you're interested in the freshwater salt water, that paper which I wrote in 1976 is available on my website. And there's a special royalty provision. Um, and that is that if you quote it on your blog, you have to send one dollar to my fund, which uh, supports a graduate student for one year at MIT and one year at the University of Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> and it's growing every day. <laughs> okay, so uh, Chris Sims told me that uh, a lunch speaker should just tell jokes, um, but actually. Uh, that's not what I'm going to do, probably what I should do, but it's not what I'm going to do. Um, there's quite a bit of overlap in, in the subject matter that I'm going to talk about and uh, Chris's remarks in the first session today. Uh, there'll be a little bit more. I think the, the main differentiation is that I'm going to delve into the intertemporal substitution side of the story, which was not an important part of what he was talking about. Whether it's an important part or not, I think I'm a little bit up in the air, but I'll, I'll, I'll raise the issue. Um, one, in one respect, I will uh, follow Chris Sims' advice, and that is that there won't be any, there aren't any complicated tables with 500 numbers on them. Um, it'll be mostly pictures. One equation, the key equation, but just one equation. Um, okay, so uh, let me start with. Uh, just showing you some numbers uh, for uh, what happened in the U.S. economy uh, uh, since 2001, but uh, with main reference to uh, the crisis and the ensuing Great Recession and, uh, and disappointing uh, recovery. Uh, and the main thing to see here, this is all to scale, uh, is that in, these, in the three categories that I've shown here, uh, the, the other category that we normally think about would, would be uh, net exports, but nothing much happened in net exports, so I won't go into that. Uh, the first thing to say, of course, is that government purchases did absolutely nothing. Uh, it was famously the intention of, of uh, the incoming president uh, to try to crank up government purchases, but absolutely nothing net happened. Uh, so, uh, so we don't in the sense that we think the government purchases are probably a pretty potent policy tool, especially at the zero lower bound, but uh, nothing actually happened. It was offsetting, although the federal government did uh, provide some support, some infrastructure spending, it was offset by declines in state and local uh, purchases, so nothing happened to purchases. Um, so the big action was uh, in uh, what I would consider the household part of the story, and this is an unusual decomposition of the national income accounts because I'm putting residential investment, which is motivated by things that happen at the household level as part of the household controlled part, uh, and then business investment excludes, so it's not, it's not the NIPA investment, it's just business investment. Okay, so you can see what happened uh, was, and you contrast this to 2001, uh, there was a pronounced dip uh, in this household category. Now, if you break it apart, uh, services, which is a large fraction of the total, uh, was, uh, ha had a substantial dollar dip, although in percentage amounts it was smaller. Uh, of course, there was a big decline in residential investment uh, during this period, 
and also a big decline in, in purchases in durables. Uh, car sales, which normally are about 16 million, fell to uh, about around 10 million uh, at the trough in 2009, uh, just to give you some sense of how big this hit was. Uh, so of course, to a consumption analyst, uh, this question of, of just what's going on in the household that could generate uh, such a large uh, uh, decline uh, is of great interest. Um, now the, so we bring two things, two basic ideas to consumption fluctuations. Um, one is uh, an income or wealth type effect, a household well-being. Um, and, but we always think about that in terms of a consumption smoothing model where uh, any change that's well-being related uh, should be uh, a permanent change. That's the random walk idea. And that, that's permeated economics, uh, certainly long before I started working on it. That, that was a, the main message of, of uh, Friedman and Modigliani's uh, contributions to uh, consumption economics in the 1950s. Uh, so, so that's one idea. And of course, uh, we're, we're, the, the interesting question then is, if, if people coming into a recession believe that recessions always are followed by recoveries. Um, that's never failed. We have not had a single recession ever in the history of the U.S. or other countries that wasn't followed by some recovery. Even this one has a pretty substantial recovery now uh, behind. So, uh, so if you think that's transitory, then you'd think that consumption smoothing would be an important part of the story. Now, of course, consumption smoothing applies to uh, uh, the concept, the the parts of consumption that are not durable, um, uh, the, the consumption smoothing proposition ought to apply to uh, the service flow of, of durables, housing and, and consumer durables. Um, so if we see a decline in expenditure, but we actually saw a large decline in non-durables and services as well. So that suggests that households within that line of thought, if that were the only influence, uh, were uh, pushed in the direction of um, thinking that their, their permanent well-being had declined. Now, of course, there's a good basis for that. Uh, uh, the U.S. economy is way, way, way behind where it would have been had it continued uh, trends of output. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a paper for the April macroannual that's dissecting this, but the starting point for that paper is output today uh, is 12 percent below where it would have been if absolutely nothing had happened if we just continued the trend uh, from 1990 through 2007. So there's just been a gigantic, and so far that's mostly permanent. Very little of that gap has chain has closed. We've had a recovery in the sense that GDP has been growing, but it should have been growing anyway, and we're not closing the gap at all so far. Now, a lot of forecasters think we will start closing the gap. Um, uh, so I've dissected that. I won't go into that in more detail, but just to say that uh, it looks like there's a pretty good basis for thinking that some of that is permanent, that we're now on a lower uh, growth path. Um, and that, of course, would map into a, a large reduction in, in consumption from the consumption smoothing uh, perspective. Okay, so uh, this is essentially the ki same kind of numbers that Chris was talking about, uh, uh, but rather than introduce the concept of saving, saving is a concept that I've never used in any of my work. Um, uh, and the fundamental, uh, the fundamentals are, of course, consumption, which is, which is something that, that is a commodity flow that we can measure quite accurately. There is this elusive concept called income. Um, Irving Fisher uh, wrote and uh, convinced me uh, from his deathbed uh, that uh, we shouldn't really, instead of talking about income, we should just talk about consumption. So if you want to learn about household well-being, look at consumption, don't look at income. And that's, that's kind of an obvious thing to do. But it is still, income is a benchmark. So I'm using the benchmark here, just as Chris used it, saving as a benchmark. So we're talking about the same thing here. In a, if, if, if there were a large transitory hit to uh, the household, then uh, under consumption smoothing view, uh, the decline uh, in income would be greater than the decline in consumption, uh, and the uh, consumption income ratio 
uh, would rise. Instead, uh, as you can see here, uh, there was a remarkable reduction. So consumption, consumption fell more than disposable income. So I'm going to pursue two lines of thought uh, in discussing that. Um, one is that that represented a huge change in the relationship of the household to financial institutions. That's the, uh, and, the and that would be the direct result of, of the financial crisis. And the other is intertemporal substitution. Uh, now, to make this be intertemporal substitution, it's going to have to be an increase uh, in uh, the rate of return that uh, households apply in informing their intertemporal consumption plan. So can we pull that off? Well, that's a topic I've been working on in, in, in the labor market. And I think the answer is at least partly yes. That'll be the last thing that I talk about. Uh, but now I want to talk about uh, this idea that financial institutions, thanks to the events uh, of 2007 and 2008, especially um, uh, the events around Lehman in, in September of 2008, uh, resulted in a large financial squeeze on the household. So I'll show you a number of uh, ways of looking at that. First of all, if you just look in the flow of funds uh, and look at uh, real household liabilities, uh, they were growing rapidly uh, uh, pre-crisis. Here we are in the crisis, and they've really collapsed since then. They've just recently begun to turn around. This is not quite the most recent numbers. Uh, but. Um, people finally just recently said, hooray, uh, households are finally uh, beginning to borrow more instead of paying off. And, you know, that's, there is now, we've, I th my, my calculations, we're just entering into the period when the financial squeeze on the household is letting up um, and uh, we're getting closer to uh, normal in the sense of at least, at least the household is not being forced to cut consumption uh, by the demands of financial institutions to be repaid. Uh, there is a big dispute here, and it's a, I should say at, at home it's a big dispute because my wife, who tracks these numbers even more than I do, and says, honey, you've got it wrong. We, we've been debating this whether I've got it right or not, and I still haven't convinced her. But um, uh, the big issue here uh, is that there's two ways that, that uh, liabilities can decline. They can def decline through defaults, and we know that defaults are pretty extensive, uh, and they can decline because of net repayments. Um, so, so a big question, and those differ tremendously. One of the weird things that I don't understand at all about commentary about, the, uh, about the, what's happened to the household in the, during this period is uh, when you think about what happens in a default, and it's, uh, mortgage defaults are obviously what matters here, um, then you see the following sequence of events. A household stops putting out cash for its mortgage. It sits in that house typically, I think, for about two years rent-free. That's a big increment to income. Um, all this pressure uh, to do something about uh, mortgage defaults and, and eventual foreclosures seems to neglect the fact that the household in that situation is getting a big benefit out of it. So this idea that we should stop foreclosures, uh, especially if it's by saying, well, it's, let's just slightly reduce the amount they have to perform on their mortgages, it doesn't compare to the, to the subsidy they're getting by being foreclosed, simply because the foreclosure process takes so long. Um, uh, and, and banks, of course, have been very, very reluctant to rewrite mortgages, but very uh, accepting of non-performing uh, uh, borrowers. So, so that's an interesting mystery, but we're, of course we're coming to the end of that, uh, so it's, it's, I'm pretty much talking about history at this point. Um, okay, so, so I've done this, uh, which I, if it's right, is very dramatic. Uh, there's people in the Federal Reserve Board uh, who have been toiling over this topic of trying to d dissect the numbers. So we have these pretty good flow of funds numbers which report uh, balance sheets, but notwithstanding the name of the flow of funds, it's not what it claims to be. Because they get the flows just by taking the annual first differences of, of, the, of the stocks. So there's nothing in the flow of funds that tells you whether a decline in liabilities was a repayment uh, or a default. Uh, and overcoming that problem has turned out to be kind of difficult. 
Anyway, here's what you get if you combine uh, all the sources of data that I know about. Um, and that is that during, during the boom period, households were playing a very large cash flow Ponzi game. They were, uh, so this is simply the net amount of cash flowing. The horizontal line is, is balance, where, uh, the, where households are borrowing the same amount that they're repaying, either in principal or interest. So this is all on a cash basis. Um, so during the, uh, uh, during the boom period, and, and this, of course, was what Chris was talking about, uh, we have this uh, period of, of cash flowing from financial institutions in the form of new mortgages, per newer, higher, bigger purchase mortgages, uh, refis, uh, uh, credit, expansion of credit card debt, all those things uh, combined were way more than the amount being paid back by the household. And this, this is percent of consumption, so this is a big uh, contribution to the ability of, to the resources available to households. And those households, which are about 50% of households that operate on a hand-to-mouth basis, simply turn this into consumption. Uh, uh, and uh, that was a significant boost to consumption. We saw that in Chris's numbers as, as very low saving rates. Uh, then, right at the crisis, you had this huge swing uh, in which, as we, as we crossed this line, now households are paying cash back. This is, with my attempt, using the limited data available on uh, defaults, we just have remarkably little accounting for defaults in the U.S. accounting system. Anyone who solved that problem, uh, I would love to hear about it. Uh, but then you see this, this big swing from 2006 to uh, 2008, uh, which is in the neighborhood of 10 percentage points of consumption uh, of cash now squeezing the household, uh, squeezing consumption for the hand-to-mouth uh, 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 households. Uh, and it, you know, initially bad, and uh, I, I would love to extend this. I haven't done this because it's so, because well, I, I could say my wife won't let me, but anyway. Uh, finding out what's happening here. I've been waiting for the, the Federal Reserve Board to, to help me out on this, but I don't think that they've gone public with any of these numbers yet. And rep represents a, what a difficult you know, challenge it is. So, so one conclusion I get from this is, surely it's the case that the squeeze of financial institutions whose, <coughs> whose uh, willingness to lend uh, uh, decline. Their ability to lend on a secured basis obviously was, was very much eroded by the decline in house values. Um, so we all know, I think we all know the story behind this, but these numbers are illustrative of, of why, uh, maybe probably one of the main reasons that uh, consumption fell. Um, so, uh, well, let's see if we can validate this. Uh, uh, Google is now a great source of information. Anybody can run Google Trends. Um, and uh, so withdrawal penalty, um, which could be the 10 percent uh, that we were uh, just uh, that David was talking about. Uh, so it could be a withdrawal from a from a tax favored retirement plan, or it could be a withdrawal from uh, a, a commitment product like a, a CD, which is a, a pretty popular commitment product. Um, and, and it reached a peak right at the time you'd think it would. Uh, what's interesting is that it hasn't, it's still pretty high. Um, I, ran, I ran, did run this pretty recently, and it's still running quite high compared to what it was in 2006. And it, and it actually turned up. How reliable that is, I don't know. So uh, the, one of the problems with Google Trends is if you run it one month and then you run it the next month, you get a different answer. Uh, all the numbers are different. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but uh, they keep fooling around with, with it. But it's still a useful tool. Um, uh, and uh, so that suggests that, that households, more and more, a much larger number of households had their back to the wall, especially in 2009, uh, sufficient to consider invading and paying the, the whatever penalty they were thinking of uh, uh, to get access to funds. Um, Okay, so here's, here's something that we talked about uh, earlier, and that is uh, accumulating. Um, so this is, I've, I independently, before I realized that my former student, uh, 
John Muehlbauer had solved this problem, but I think my solution is very similar to his. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, if you, to the extent that you think that the survey is, is indicative, uh, it certainly tells a story that fits in with the timing perfectly, uh, that, and particularly mortgages. They didn't start running the survey on mortgages until 2007, um, so we don't have much history of it, but uh, it suggests a very large tightening, which is confirmed by just about every source. And mortgage is obviously the single biggest uh, financial instrument for households. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the squeeze uh, story. Uh, 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 so what I get out of this is that, uh, at, least, at least for the bottom half of the consumption distribution, uh, and possibly going up more, uh, there's uh, this discovery from the Survey of Consumer Finances um, that the hand-to-mouth uh, households go way up in the income distribution. Uh, there's plenty of people making three or $400,000 a year working in, as a lawyer or a banker uh, who uh, who's have essentially no liquid assets. They have plenty of financial flexibility, uh, and if 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 something comes along, if the bonus isn't as big as usual, they just don't buy another Mercedes. So it's not as if these people, but they don't. They're 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 very conscious apparently of the fact that uh, what they can earn on their investments is way less than the interest they would pay on borrowing. So they have no investments and no borrowing. They're at that kink that point that sticks out and attracts uh, the indifference curve uh, for many different indifference curves. So, so a sig very significant fraction of U.S. households have no significant debt and no significant liquid assets. Um, and uh, so when you squeeze those people financially, they're going to respond. And part of what's the first thing that's going to respond is durables consumption, um, house as well, counting housing as well as uh, consumer durables. It's, you have to squeeze them pretty hard to get their uh, their services and non-durables consumption down, but it, it, it can happen, obviously. And some of those people lost their jobs or had large declines in income, um, and, uh, and so cut their consumption. Um, so, so I get out of this. It's, I think it's difficult to quantify. I've, I've made some effort to build this into a model and quantify it, uh, but uh, I will leave you just with the thought that the numbers do suggest that uh, Probably the bulk of, of the adverse cyclical development, the burst of unemployment and decline in product demand, uh, was, uh, was in the household rather than business. I, I, having investigated this over the last five years, I'm pretty convinced that the recession was largely a household recession. Of course, there was a big decline in, in plant and equipment investment, but I, I believe that most of that essentially is, a, is a, uh, a response to what happened in the household. That makes this very unusual, the very opposite of the 2001, the 2001 recession, which in the labor market at least was a pretty serious event. Uh, uh, there was no signs of any of these things on the household level. It was, it was a big decline in, in especially equipment investment, uh, but it had a very different character from, uh, from this recession. Okay, so let me turn to the intertemporal substitution uh, and uh, just observe, this is the only equation in this talk, uh, that uh, sigma in my notation is the intertemporal elasticity itself. Perversely, so many people call it one over sigma, but that gets you into all kinds of, of reciprocals that, that aren't clean notation. So make clean notation, we call it sigma. Um, and uh, then there's the opposite influences uh, of the uh, control by sigma of dt, which is a discount rate, uh, a, an expected return, uh, minus uh, the countervening factor, which is the rate of impatience of the household. Um, so then the question is, uh, uh, if, you, if you thought that uh, uh, that the right thing to put in here uh, to, to think about what's happening to consumption. Well, first of all, of course, to the extent of you regard this as an asset pricing equation, there's a whole vector of these, uh, Hanson-Singleton vector, uh, which uh, all of which have to be satisfied. Uh, 
Well, let's put that aside for a second and just talk about uh, one of those equations that has to be satisfied. And that would be one that, that represents, so dt is going to be the, the, I would think of it as the, the financial risk of uh, future consumption. And because we're looking here at what the household is thinking about what's happening now and let's say consumption a year from now. Um, so the same thing, tools that we bring to analyzing uh, returns in the stock market um, and, and returns in general could be applied here. We know that interest rates uh, fell to zero by the end of um, 2008. So, so uh, if, you, if, you, if you're just thinking about this from the interest rate perspective, uh, then that would suggest that uh, consumption growth uh, would, would fall, and in order to satisfy the budget constraint, that means the current consumption has to rise, standard analysis. On the other hand, if you think of DT here as uh, something that reflects the kind of risk of the stock market uh, uh, prices, um, uh, then it's very clear that DT rose. I'll show you the numbers in a second. Uh, but a standard modern finance Campbell-Shiller uh, framework uh, analysis of this would suggest that, that DT actually rose, meaning that there was a very large increase in the equity premium. Um, and uh, and that's, that's essentially what I believe, and it's a topic that I've been thinking about in the labor market. I think it's also secondarily important for plant and equipment investment, but for consumption growth, it could be important. Uh, so if the, if the analysis is we have to satisfy this equation for a DT, which rose a lot, uh, then we get the opposite response. We get uh, planned consumption growth and therefore low current level of consumption. Again, perfectly standard uh, modern consumption theory. Uh, uh, okay, so I think I've probably talked about this. Um, yeah. But that was my phone. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, so let's do Campbell Schiller. So this is a, a recent. Uh, uh, version of uh, Campbell Schiller that uh, that I've worked on in, in the other paper that I mentioned, uh, and there was a big spike right at the right time, right at the time that consumption fell. Uh, there was a huge spike uh, in the discount rate implicit in the S and P. Now, in Campbell Schiller terms, that's easy to explain. Uh, the main forecaster. Uh, in Campbell Scheller uh, is the level of the stock market uh, normalized by dividends, so it's the uh, price dividend ratio. Price dividend ratio of the S&P fell a lot, uh, and uh, that coincided then with a big increase, very substantial increase, uh, up to about 17 percent uh, at its highest. Uh, th this, this Campbell Scheller equation also has uh, 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 the level of normalized level of consumption. Uh, in it as well, and that's a secondary. But it's mainly just the simple campbell shelley logic that expected returns are higher when the market's low and low when it's high. Uh, uh, so, so if you then go back and say, all right, so the, the, uh, uh, we have to satisfy this equation, uh, then, then that's going to suggest um, that that equation at least is going to be satisfied by uh, having a lower level of consumption and then uh, expected consumption growth. It's a fascinating question, and I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many debates here in the literature. For example, there's a big debate about the value of sigma. In my 1988 JPE paper on that subject, I think I reached the conclusion that it was ha one half. At least that's the number that I've always used. <laughs> uh, of course, in finance, it's common to take it to be above one, uh, which, which I would question. Um, uh, by the way, I think that the coefficient of relative risk aversion is two, uh, and that means that I have no need for Epstein's in, right? Because my sigma is exactly the reciprocal. So Epstein's in is fabulous, great idea, but not necessary in practice. That would be my view, but I could be wrong, uh, and uh, and we get very uh, I, there, there's a recent interesting paper that's basically taken, there's hundreds of studies now of estimating sigma from different sources. They do, by the way, cluster around 0.5, I'm happy to say, but there's a wide dispersion. 
Uh, so reasonable people can disagree about the value sigma, and that's going to be a first order importance uh, for resolving this question. But I think it's still a very open question, and I would certainly encourage people to, to be thinking about uh, whether, whether, the, the, whether this line of thought, uh, big enough sigma for this to matter, and uh, a big enough increase in the equity premium so that satisfying this equation requires lower current consumption. The other view, of course, which is that uh, we also have to satisfy the pricing of uh, the interest rate, would point in the opposite direction. And reconciling that is, is another interesting finance project, household finance type project. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess that's it. Um, uh, so let me just try to summarize. Um, I think that uh, the the three factors that I've talked about together amply uh, explain uh, what we observe. Uh, first, a permanent decline in, in household welfare, which would bring down, correspondingly reduce uh, all levels of consumption. Uh, second, uh, the uh, squeeze by financial institutions uh, draining uh, purchasing power from the household. And third, uh, intertemporal substitution motivated by the same factors that spooked uh, the stock market temporarily uh, spooked consumption. That would be an easy way to put it. For the latter, by the way, as you can see from this picture, um, uh, it was pretty transitory. Um, and we're kind of back to normal in terms of, of the discount rate implicit in the S&P. Uh, so, so that factor uh, uh, has played out and, and in fact, consumption when that fell, consumption should have snapped back on this account. Um, but uh, it has to a considerable extent, but not as much. Uh, so there's still lots of role, and, and presumably to the extent that, that uh, I'm right that the uh, that, uh, household well-being is, took, took a permanent hit. Uh, obviously, that says that consumption will have taken a permanent hit, as output has. Um, so uh, I think all three then, just to summarize, then all three, I, I'm pretty satisfied, can account for what we see there. I don't see that there's a consumption mystery. Uh, there's probably a lot of more research to be done to, to allocate among these three influences. Um, looking to the future then in terms of consumption, the, both the, the withdrawal of value from the household and the intertemporal substitution effect are, are dissipating or fully dissipated. So we're left only with this decline in, in perception of permanent uh, well-being. Um, and that turns on all the, on the essentially supply factors, um, which, which this new paper of mine is trying to engage. Um, and, uh, and it does look like a lot of them are, do have a permanent character. So that would make sense, too. OK, let me now throw it open. Who, who's, how are we going to run this? Marcus, are you going to call on people, or are we going to sit like the other? The, the, in terms of the, the housing stock and the transactions we've seen, if we take the house, just the, the, the stock of property, is is the new transactions and slightly lower LTVs and a bunch of cash offers enough to get <clears throat> the aggregate numbers some of your delevering? Is, right? The numbers where you and I live is staggering in the amount of cash offers and property. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you asking, uh, is, the, is the mortgage part of, of the delevering uh, process complete? So no, I'm asking those, those numbers you had were aggregate for the delevering. And right. presumably, there's been a delevering of the housing stock because of the, who's transacting and how they're transacting with more sure, cash. Sure. Is that so? We we we're, we're talking a lot about the household budget budget, thinking about the households, but it, is it just the in the aggregate the housing stock? Well, right, no. It's, am it, I it, making it, sense? It, Maybe. The it, it's what's happened to the uh, the borrowing against the housing stock. Now, obviously, much of much of the Delevering occurred as a result of of uh, uh, people f finding themselves in a non-viable position uh, as a result of a decline in both income and their housing prices. But 
it's not it's not directly linked to it's it's linked to housing prices in that sense. But but these these numbers are are drawn from data on on the outstanding mortgages. Is that does that help? I, I was asking. Let me just follow up. I actually sent you the link, so you'll have it, your email. So Neil Buta actually at the Fed has looked at the, you know, the Fed guys have this individual credit panel data. Yeah. So delinquencies are obviously huge, which I don't think is a mystery. But the fact that he finds, which I think is quite interesting, is that um, the decline in the other part of the decline in aggregate household debt seems to be driven more by lower take on of debt rather than active payback. And I think what Adair is saying, which might be one of the channels, is that the marginal home buyers are now not people who are paying with mortgages, but instead they're paying with cash. And so that, you know, the, the Neil Buta paper suggests that's a really big reason mm -hmm. for the non-default -de -de part of the deleveraging. It's actually not active payback of debt. It's just that the marginal increase in debt over time is going down because people can't get leveraged to buy homes. Well, wait, though, that we're, I mean, we're, the, the, the amount of the debt, uh, is actually declining. It's not your story would make. So take sense out delinquencies. Flat. The point is to take out delinquencies, and then when you're left with that, the claim is that it's mostly just a, a slowdown in the increase, not an active decline. That's the claim of this paper. So, so you're saying all of the actual decrease we observe uh, can be assigned to a default? I don't know the paper that well, but that would sound like. There is, no, but there's another one. Yeah, but it's offset by people who are, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, I think the way it's not my paper, but so now at, at this point, you know, I, that's that's the kind of top line abstract result. Is is okay? Is, I, 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 he calls it given, outflows and inflows, and he says that it's basically the that the majority of the decline in debt is default, and then the rest of the aggregate movement in debt, which you're right, this would imply that it must not be going down, is just a slowdown in the growth of the aggregate. Yeah. Okay. But it, but it, however you tell the story, it, it amounts to the same thing, which is that the the households were uh, financing consumption by increasing debt outstanding, uh, and that came to an abrupt end, uh, and uh, and then they were they began to pay it back. I, I don't I don't see how it's no, it does it doesn't. There's no qualification to that that comes from the fact that then then people started buying houses for cash. The, the the people who who well I guess I guess it's part of the, they some some group of people financed I guess this is the right way to put it. I, I think this is the right way to put your point some people financed uh, their uh, their the fact that they had to pay back their mortgage from the proceeds of the sale of a house and then became a renter um, and that would be not be a squeeze on consumption okay so that that's that's a good point that's okay I think we finally got it yeah. So I'm going to comment on the last mechanism, the mapping from return expectations to consumption. And I want to challenge the mechanism because I think at this point there's a pretty strong consensus that in general expectations for future asset returns are pro-cyclical. So that when the economy is doing well and the market's done well recently, the overwhelming general public thinks forward-looking returns are going to be high, which is, of course, contrary to what we know is true empirically. But again, what matters for your theory is the public's expectations, not the Campbell and Schiller forecasting model. Actually, no, can I respectfully disagree with that? I, I, I see it quite differently that uh, I use the word spook. Um, when you look at actual behavior, I agree with what you're saying about uh, you, you get these weird things in expectations um, if you ask people what they expect. But if you look at how they behave, they get much more cautious. You know, plant and equipment investment is clearly subject to this. Uh, That's just, not the general public. It, it, look, look, at, look at asset allocation across different asset classes on the part of households. Uh -huh. It exactly follows the expectation survey data. All the data at the household level, not firms, that's a totally different story. Okay. Households, okay. Okay. which Household. is consumption, yeah. it all maps, maps up beautifully with the notion that people have an extrapolation or some kind of vague extrapolation theory in the back Agreed. of their minds. Agreed. But look what they actually do. They behave 
uh, when the economy is tanking, uh, they clearly behave as if they were facing high discount rates. That's the key point. You're, you're right. I'm saying you're not identified. I'm saying if you actually look at stuff where you can directly map expectations to things like asset allocation, meaning, okay. you know, I've got, I've got five stocks. Which stock do I double down on? It's the stock that did well last year um, or over the last five years. Uh, where, where you're very well identified, you see that it, it's in fact, and it's behavior, and it's money on the table, you see that it's the wrong expectation model on the part of the general public. So, so I'm, 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 I'm going to assert that, that the, the, the evidence that you're offering is kind of peripheral to the actual substance of their beliefs. Oh, oh I, I, again, I totally, respectfully, completely disagree with that. They, households are spooked. They, they behave as if they had higher discount rates. They don't, in particular, they're unwilling to purchase the, the <laughs> of course, of course, of course. No. And uncertainty is high may also, yeah. may also feed into um, uh, ex post and ex ante uh, higher returns. But the, the uncertainty is high is not part of the uh, linearized Euler equation that you put up uh, for us to admire. Oh, no, no, again, I, I, wrote it, I wrote it in a way that I don't think you've ever written a, a, an Euler equation, nor had I until I got to start thinking along these lines. I put in the discount which incorporates the risk that you're talking about. Yeah. Remember? The, okay, so it's different. Yes, but then well, I know what you're thinking of. But the problem with doing it that way is that it shouldn't be multiplied by that same sigma um, that multiplies the interest, uh, the, the rate of return, because the uncertainty term, I mean, maybe your D would actually include two subcomponents, one of which is mm -hmm. a rate of return and the other of which is a sort of differently calibrated um, uncertainty term. But then it doesn't make much sense to multiply it by the sigma. Now we're really getting into the weeds. Sorry. Okay. Well, <coughs> we'll, we'll reconcile this privately later. But uh, it, it, I think it, I th my guess is that it comes close. Uh, questions about uh, sigma or any other details, <laughs> but you can also <laughs> spread it out and uh, go more for the bigger picture. I just wanted to make one point about the distinction between the people in this room and the people we study. You made the, the, the comment about the $300,000 people living, struggling, and with two children in full-time daycare, I could really relate. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I, I kind of looked it up, and uh, you know, quickly, back of the envelope, $300,000 is a great cutoff mark for the top 1% of households, which would be two $150,000 earners in a, you know, equal family. Among individuals, it would be eight out of every hundred, uh, eight out of every thousand men would earn 300,000 and two out of every thousand women mm -hmm. would earn 300,000 on their own. So it's a shockingly small percent of the population and how they relate may, you know, per other conversations may have absolutely nothing to do with the other 990 per thousand people out there. Oh, okay. I, uh, sorry, but I, I, I must have misspoken. I just, I was saying that it's the, the great mass of Americans are hand-to-mouth consumers, which is exactly what you're saying too, I believe. Yeah. As far up as in the stratosphere, but, but that includes all the atmosphere right down to, to Death Valley. So. <laughs> So I'm glad you still have this slide up. I'm absolutely fascinated by this slide. Um, so when I think of a discount rate uh, for an equity, Thanks. I think of sort of decomposing it into the risk-free rate plus, assuming we're using log return, so plus time value of money plus the risk premium. So in other words, some representation of how risk tolerant the market is at that time. So 
I'm, I'm just, just a small question about when the data starts. Does that include sort of the March 2000 crash in the, in the S&P? And, and then I guess if it's a negative discount rate and you're including the time value of money and the risk-free rate, then that's essentially implying that um, people were, have gotten much more risk averse up to that 17%. And then w sort of what, what psychologically do you think accounts for such a huge variation? <laughs> okay. Well, that's the question of finance. Um, any financial economist who could answer that question would instantly win the next Nobel Prize. Um, so finance has struggled and struggled and struggled, uh, come up with all kinds of hokey models, like Campbell Cochran, uh, uh, that... Uh, that somehow try to sell the possibility that people have a coefficient of relative risk aversion of 40 or 100 or maybe just 80. Uh, those are examples of numbers that have come out in that literature. Um, uh, there's some interesting work that I've been following uh, recently that uh, Jules Van Binsbergen and co-authors uh, have done to show that um, there's even a lot of volatility uh, of the risk premium uh, for relatively short future uh, cash claims, like to dividends. They've done some very interesting work on, on the pricing of, of dividend strips, um, which uh, brings the mystery you know, right up close, because there's some, been some developments in finance suggesting that the things that are subtle things that are happening to consumption growth in the distant future could map into these changes in discounts, but uh, this work on, on short term on the high volatility of expected returns, that is discounts, um, on, on two year out claims has, has just deepened the mystery. Uh, there's also recent research that uh, attempts to uh, decompose these numbers, which are well known from Campbell-Shiller tradition, um, into those that come from things that we can identify typically related to consumption growth and things that uh, are a complete mystery. And mystery is 85% of the story in that decomposition. So, so finance has a long way to go um, uh, to, to answer that question of just what's going on. How, how can it be that there's so much volatility in discount rates? But my take on that is, is fine. I don't think I know how to answer that question. But I want to pay close attention to the implications I've been doing that most recently in the labor market, but then it occurred to me when I was getting ready for this talk that um, that the same thing applies to consumption economics. So um, when I when I wrote my 1988 paper, I included Livingston measures of, of forecasts of S&P, um, but I thought, oh, these forecasts are crazy, but now I'm not so sure I was right about that. Just a quick follow-up. Have you thought of an interesting graph would be if you were to subtract out time value of money in a risk or a risk free rate and then just do a graph of the risk premium, it would probably be even more extreme than this. A little bit. Given yeah. the fact that interest rates are so low on the second half of the graph and were higher on so you would actually have like a negative risk premium in Sure. In of course two, in 2000. I, I have to confess that there are sampling errors here. This is a fitted value from a regression, so it inherits all the the uh, sampling variation from, from those coefficients. So I'm not sure how seriously I would take the negativity. But you're right, you could subtract. Uh, this is sort of the, the, the older strand, the, the, the CAPM strand of finance, which I think is not the way financial economists typically think about the problem today, um, uh, tends to think of the risk premium as something that's kind of a constant. But this research shows that the risk premium is anything but a constant. So we don't typically then do the old CAPM distinction that you were talking about of, of writing down a, a, uh, a risk premium and, and uh, over a, a safe rate. We just, we just write this down. This is just a direct uh, discount rate inferred directly from, from the stock market. Okay. Thanks a lot uh, to everybody. Let's give uh, a hand to Bob. And <laughs> Thanks a lot.